Welcome to Life Renewed Ministries. I'm Pastor Gary French here at Life Church in Buckner, Kentucky. I want to take this opportunity to just express my thanks for your being a part of our service today. Today, you're going to hear the start of a series that I've entitled, When Bad Things Happened. And the introduction is rather lengthy, and we're going to get into uh, several series on this sermon. And it's, it's going to really help you to understand, first of all, bad things happen to everyone. I know that's breaking news, but bad things happen to everyone. We're going to look for biblical answers as to how we can know that when bad things happen, how should we address them? What should we do? So I want you to sit down, relax, enjoy the service today. Feel free to contact us. Let us know how we can minister to you and know this much that there's always hope in Jesus Christ. He has not been caught off guard by what's going on in your life. And we want you to know we will be there with you. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in today. Well, I want us to know that bad things happen, and when bad things happen, we need to accept this fact. It happens. Bad stuff happens all the time. That's one thing that I've learned in my life, that bad things truly do happen, and we all say that we know that, that bad things happen. And we can either sing about the bad things that are happening, we complain about the bad things, or we can do something about them. There's not a single person under the sound of my voice who has not experienced something bad in their life. All of us have. All of us have experienced pain. All of us have have experienced some kind of problem that we felt we could never get over. When the doctor gives you a bad medical report or tells you that because of that report, you're going to die soon because because of some cancer or some other ailment, You can either accept his diagnosis or you can do something about it. The doctor said this, so I'm going to live my life up to the expectations of what the doctor said. That's the best life you're ever going to have now, so you've just got to accept it and deal with it. Bunk. Pardon me for such harsh language. But just because someone says this is what my destiny is to be does not mean it shall be that way. The real question is this. When something bad comes your way, for surely it will one day, the real question is, what are you going to do about it? What will you do? And my friends, what you do depends on how you prepare for the issues of life. The unprepared person will lament their situation and complain about how unlucky they happen to be. You're so much better off than you must be really lucky. Never looking at the fact that someone has spent years working hard in their trade, acquiring a skill, not wasting their life complaining about how bad everything is. The unprepared person will sulk and sit in a corner waiting for something good to come his way. Sort of like the man at the pool of Bethesda was waiting, Bethsaida, I was thinking about the army waiting for someone to heal him. Because the pagans would teach that when the water was stirred, that whoever was first got into the pool would be healed. And he tried for years, and he never could get close to it. Marianne reminded me the other day when we were watching that episode on The Chosen, couldn't he have at least wiggled over the years and somehow fallen into the water accidentally? The real issue came down. This man became content in his ailment. He accepted the fact that he was crippled. And we don't even use that word today, crippled. We can't can't use that. That's not being sensitive enough. We've allowed our focus to be the PC culture of today rather than accepting bad stuff happens, and when it happens, what will we do about it? Because, my friend, when you, what you do in any situation, situation is connected, how you prepare, what you believe how you view the problem, what you want to do. Where do you want to go? From my perspective, it seems that some folks think their life is nothing but bad because they encounter bad with such great regularity. Moses was about to complete his service as leader of the nation. He was 120 years old and God had informed him, your time to lead is over. And the great deliverer used this occasion to deliver a final speech anointing Joshua and telling the people, here's what's about to happen. And let me tell you, his parting speech seemed to be filled with parting shots. 
at the leaders and the people. And from a purely feel-good perspective, his speech was not a positive speech where the folks would just feel all toasty inside. Bad things truly happen. And he was letting them know, it's about to happen. And my friends, when bad things happen, people will ask it this way, why is this happening to me? And what they mean by that question is, why is all this bad stuff happening to me all along when everybody else seems to be getting off scot-free? Moses told the nation, bad times are coming. His words were not encouraging, but they were condemning. He told them that bad times would come, and he gave the reason as to why the bad times would come. We can have a great politician say, they elect me and the good times will come, and then we can believe the lies of another person, and then he gets elected, and we see how truly bad things can come in such a short period of time. How is it possible for one president to spend $6 trillion in the first 100 days of his presidency? Knowing the fact that bad things happen and that they happen all the time, we need to ask ourselves this one simple, profound question. It eludes us, but it can change us. And here's the question. Why? The easy theological response answers that single word question of why this way. Because we live in a fallen world and evil exists. I don't dispute that at all. But for the person who does not believe the biblical response, the answer we provide for them because evil exists and we live in a fallen world, that's not sufficient for them. They would say this, perhaps, there's no such thing as good or evil because all views are equal. Therefore, no such thing as a biblical worldview or understanding of right or wrong is possible. Good and evil doesn't exist. It's all in my mind. Let me give you a breaking news statement. The Christian faith is an exclusive faith. Yes, we are narrow-minded because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the answer. He is an inclusive that all may come, whosoever will may come, but He is exclusive in the manner by which they come and move on to heaven. We cannot and we should not, we must not, allow a pluralistic sort of belief to filter into our worship to seep into our faith. Remember this, my friends, the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Not just knowing about Him, the Lordship of Jesus Christ in your life and my life is central, central to the apologist of the faith, the defender who argues for the Christian faith. To remove Christ from the core center, the very value of our life and our belief and our theological presuppositions is to lose our faith and to erase our hope. If we remove Christ, the central theme of Christ, from who we are and what we do and how we worship and where we go and how we love and how we take this message of hope to everyone, if we remove Christ from that scenario, we have no hope. If we accept that there is no absolute truth then we also accept the blasphemous point of view that there are many truths. That may be true for you, but it's not true for me. That may apply to you, but it doesn't apply to me. That may be a valid argument for you, but it doesn't apply to me. I think that there's many ways to get to heaven, not just Jesus. I'm going to change the reality of what God has said. And we start to defy the laws of God. In the same way that someone would try to defy, as Joe pointed out on Wednesday night, the law of gravity. If all faiths and religions are true and equal, then Christianity is false. And it's dangerous for us to allow the seepage as a sewer of foreign beliefs and other attitudes to come into our Christian faith. How many of you know the United States motto of E Pluribus Unum? It means out of many, one. It's not our diversity that makes us great as Americans. It's our uniting around a central core tenet that we are Americans. We are not hyphenated anything. We are Americans living in the United States of America. And that means that we as Americans are together in our tenet of belief. And the socialist view is a pluralistic and atheistic religion that seeks to change the American values and our motto instead of meaning out of many one, out of one, many. 
And when you have that, you have chaos and confusion, a cacophony of voices that seem to filter throughout the landscape. The anti-Christian crowd likes to mock serious followers of Jesus and attempt to intimidate us to remain silent and don't be involved in society. You Christians, if we allow you to meet and gather, and if we as the government deem that you are essential, then we will grant you permission to come together, but you can't do it with too many in one crowd. You can't have it on such great regularity. We don't want you to hear the teachings of the Word of God. We want you to have feel-good messages about flowers and hope and rainbows and puppy dogs. My friends, the more we remain silent, the more we allow the the anti-Christian mob to affect us, the more we allow them to define what it means to be a Christian, the less likelihood we will survive. Let's forget about influencing culture because there will be no influence of culture. The part-time follower of Christ who only follows according to his pleasure, her desire, what they seek, will never succeed in the walk of being a disciple of Christ. They're always just close enough to think, I should change. On a large scale, it seems like the anti-Christian crowd has been successful. And you'd say, well, pastor, how could you say that? Here's how I can say that, because scores of churches across the United States are silent today. Not only in just not meeting, but they're silent because they're not tackling the hot topic issues of today because they're too politically charged. We can't talk about life and pro-life. We can't talk about uh, abortion. We can't talk about the homosexual agenda. We can't talk about the need to make a stand. We can't talk about this politician or that politician. Listen, my friends, either the Word of God is true or none of it is true. We cannot acquiesce to the position that we can only preach and teach and believe according to what others say. The church is silent. Pastors are timid. And church members have become docile. Like a little lap dog. They're quiet, sitting upon your lap. They dare not even shed the smallest amount of hair onto your pants because you'll become offended. Now sit there and be quiet. Hi, I'm Sandy Dedman, and I would just like to let you know how much I love the Lord. I accepted the Lord as my Savior when I was about 12 years old, and I've always asked the Lord to let me experience more of Him and to just let me see Him. And as I've grown, I've grown in the Lord a lot, but since I've been coming to Life Church, I've just grown immensely, and I retired about four years ago, and I've really been in the Word a lot. Uh, Pastor Gary really encourages us to be in the Word, to know the Word for ourselves, and it really does bring God to life. And the messages that Pastor Gary has for each of us is a serious message. He doesn't mince words. He loves to just preach the word like it is. And that's what we need in our lives to make us better Christians, to make us servants for God, and to just be what he wants us to be. So I strongly encourage you, if you're looking for a church, to really hear the word of God in the way that that will help you to live a life that's, that's for God and, and happy, then come to Life Church. When Gideon faced a challenge, it was an overwhelming obstacle from the Midianites. And the human thought was that everything is lost. And Gideon asked the question in Judges chapter 6, verse 13, this way. Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? You can hear the echo from the non-believing crowd or the shallow-rooted followers of Christ. 
If God is so powerful, why is all this bad stuff happening to you all the time? If God is so good, why are you not loving and kind and accepting? Don't you see the yard sign that I've got out in front of my house? Be kind. If the Lord is with us, why is all this happening? And where are all his miracles, which his, our fathers told us about, saying, didn't the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. My friends, when bad things happen, the human response is to find an answer. And usually, when we find the answer, we place the blame on other people, other events, other groups, other politicians. The blame is on everyone and anything but us ourselves. Surely I can't be what's wrong with this situation. The person that gets into a, a marriage and it lasts for a while and then divorce and then they get into another marriage and it lasts for a short time and it's divorced. And then they get into another marriage and it's divorced and the key ingredient through all of that is anger issues. Let's just pick one of the many that we could pick. And they never correct their anger. They say, man, all these women I've been married to, they can't seem to get along with me. Huh. There's a reason for that. No, it can't be me. I want, to, I want you to consider some things with me, and I have just determined I'm only going to get through one of the main points. This was my introduction to the main teaching. Bad things happen when there is a loss of revelation. Referencing our Deuteronomy passage, when we talk about that, that loss of revelation and the understanding of what um, uh, Gideon was saying in Judges, they have an understanding of who they think God is. But when we have the loss of revelation of who God is, we forget these words. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. It seems to me that comes from one of the, the big ten, doesn't it, to you? When we either forget who God is or we lose sight of who He is and what He has done in our lives and what He can accomplish through the yielded spirit, the surrendered soul, then we diminish His importance for us. And we remove Him from the presence of the world. Bad things happen when we lose that revelation of who God is and who we are, but it also happens when we forget about His sovereignty. Either God is God or he is not. And my friends, let me remind you something that you should already know because I settled this many years ago. There is no middle ground with God. I know full well when I step onto the sinking soil of sin. I know exactly what that feels like. I know how untenuous, untenuous the, the, the untenable, the, the reaching the goal is, is for me when I step outside of his protection. I know how my heart feels. I know how my mind thinks. I know what happens to me. And I feel this dark cloud that comes over me. Some of you weren't aware of it. But last Sunday as I was preaching, there was a dark spirit in this place. I sensed the spirit that was coming against the powerful presence of God. And I refused to yield to that presence. And here's what I've determined. Here's how dark spirits get into God's house and into influence the children of God. Because we come into God's house and we talk and yammer and complain about everything but God. We're not preparing our hearts for God. We're not talking about God. We're not praising God. We're not expecting to hear from God. We're not anticipating the Spirit of God changing somebody today. We're not believing that God can save somebody today. We're not thinking that God's going to heal somebody today. Well, that He may heal somebody, but it's not going to be me. Maybe something will happen. Listen, friends, God wants to touch you not like a leaky, dripping faucet of water that needs to be repaired. He wants to touch you with the power of His Holy Spirit as if you are standing in front of a fire hose coming off an engine and they're just waiting, for, the angels are waiting to pull the lever and say, are you ready? And you just have to say, I am ready. And my friends, the way that you get ready is that you come into God's house expecting to see God. You've been praying to hear from God. You've been praying that God's life, His power would change your life. You've been desirous that His Spirit would do something, that you would feel the presence of His love. You would be encouraged. You would be energized. You'd be expecting to head out of here saying, I'm going to change the world for Jesus Christ. There is no middle ground with God. 
Why then do so many people willingly choose to abide there? This middle ground is revealed in the people's lives. I choose to love Him on my terms. I choose to serve Him on my terms. I choose to worship Him on my terms. Let me be very clear here. That is not acceptable. Some might suggest this morning that I'm being legalistic about worship and service. I've always had problems with, with people, oh, I'll go today to church or I won't go today to church. I, I'll read my Bible today or I won't read my Bible. I don't know, it's like, I've got something else to do today. And the suggestion that I'm being legalistic by forcing people to come to church, it comes usually from those people who don't want to serve God in the first place. And their, their statement of, my being legalistic is in a great revelation that they don't place God first in their life. Brother Gary, isn't God a God of love, compassion, mercy, and grace? Can I just be alone in nature and commune with God? Yeah. But you can also get ant bites, tick bites, chiggers, Sunburn, whatever else you happen to acquire out there in nature, communing with God. But God wants you to spend time in the place that He has deemed the place of worship. To come together, not to isolate yourself socially or otherwise, but to be encouraged by hearing the Word of God, to be uplifted by the proclamation of the Word, for your soul to be soothed by the reading and the, the singing of God's words and the hymns of praise and the songs of Zion, as we used to say, so that you can hear the powerful message of hope, that you can hear the answers to the dilemma that you're struggling with today. And you can know this simple fact. God does care about what's going on in my life. The problem is that there are folks who are using their values to worship God. And they're not basing it on a biblical understanding of God. I'm not being legalistic, my friends. I am merely being biblical. Amen. Proverbs 29, 18 in the King James says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. The New King James translates it this way, Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. And the Hebrew word here is both vision and revelation. It means the same thing. But the focus of the text is not about sight or a human effort to comprehend. The focus of the text is this. It tells you that when you and I have a proper understanding, we have a proper revelation of God, then He speaks to us. When you and I have an improper understanding of God and His Word, then we have chosen a life that is based on our understanding and our preferences. One translation translate Proverbs 29, 18 this way. Without revelation, people run wild. My friends, bad things happen, and we need to know that it bad things happen but the way to work through, to overcome, is to lift our eyes to Jesus Christ. Center on Him, focus on Him, live for Him. Be intimately in worship with Him. Prepare your hearts when you come into God's house and say, today is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will be glad in it. Amen. When you see a brother or sister that you know is a brother or sister, and you see the look on their face that they seem to be consumed or worried about what's going on or they're just tired about something, you take a moment to go over and give them a meaningful hug. Not one of these grandchildren hugs. You know what I mean. The grandchildren, they come up and they sort of go, one arm. Hey, Opa. The other arm must be broken there, son. No, I'm just... No, well, then wrap that other one around me, boy. Listen, we must come into the presence of God 
as children who are hungry for His Word and hug Him and hold Him and praise Him and thank Him and rejoice in Him because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. I've got at least three more points. You'll have to come back. I hope that you will. Have you received this part of the message so far? Let God know how much you appreciate Him. Father, thank you for allowing us to gather in your house this day. Thank you for your amazing, amazing grace. We praise you, Lord. And we would ask that today that we have encountered you because we've been looking for you. Let us not question why bad things happen. Let's look to the one who is the answer that can get us through everything that happens. May our lives be radically changed and transformed. May we seek Jesus Christ with all we have. May we surrender our hearts and may we just lift our eyes to you. For truly you are the author and finisher of our faith. Thank you, Father, for the word that has been proclaimed today. Thank you for the attentive people that have been here. Thank you for those that have either heard this on the radio or viewed it on television. Thank you for allowing us to share your truth because we know this much. There is but one God. There is but one Savior. There is but one Lord. And His name is Jesus. My friends, if you've never said yes to Jesus, would you turn your heart to Him today? Ask Him to forgive you of your sins. Ask Him to forgive you of your doubts. Don't let the adversary try to convince you into thinking you need to know everything about the Christian faith before you say yes to Jesus. Say yes to this. Jesus is Lord. Ask Him to come into your heart. Ask Him to cleanse you and forgive you from all unrighteousness. And the Bible gives us with great certainty He will do just that. We praise you, Father, and we thank you for allowing us to be in your service today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's praise God together.